This week's episode of Sounds Good with Brandon Harvey is brought to you by the Gradient Podcast Network. Sounds Good is one of the launch shows of the Gradient Podcast Network. Check out their other podcasts like, in case you missed it, Animalators, and It's a Bird, It's a Plane, It's a Podcast at gradient.is. That's gradient.is. Hey guys, welcome to this week's episode of Sounds Good with me, Brandon Harvey. Today I've got BC Serna on the line from his home in Denver, Colorado. Okay, so BC is a world-traveling storyteller connecting with strangers everywhere he goes. When he's not traveling the country speaking at high schools and conferences, BC can be found making films for nonprofits and mentoring inner-city youth. BC and I both just got back from a trip to Israel and Palestine where we both caught a little bit of a cold. So please excuse our raspy voices and our general jet laggedness. Let's jump straight into this. All right, I'm here with BC Serna. BC is, well, BC feels like he's been a friend for a long time. Really, we've only known each other for a very short time. Um, but BC, welcome to the show. How are you doing? Yeah, it does feel like a long time. It's so good to be here, man. Thanks so much for having me on. Um, I don't know if I'm allowed to say this, but, uh, you, we have the same first name. We do. That is borderline secret, but you, it is now out. I mean, I mean, I can cut this if you need me to, no, but you're good, bro. we're both you're named good. Brandon and you just are ashamed of this beautiful name that we both have and you've decided to hide it. I don't know where BC came from. I've had it my whole life, and I think my dad gave it to me since I was a kid, but I definitely don't mind either one. People think I do, but it's it's really, I love Brandon as well. I think that people with nicknames are superior people. Like, I always wanted to have a nickname, and I'm a little bit jealous that I'm not called BC. <laughs> <laughs> well, what's your middle name? Lee. Oh, yeah, that's right. That's right. So it would be BL. wouldn't be that as cool. Yeah, as cool. It's not as cool. So... BC, I'll say this. I was trying to describe you to somebody the other day and I was like, okay, so BC is like a filmmaker and he is like a social justice advocate and he works with youth and he travels the world and he is just really cool. But like, I don't even know if that fully encapsulates who you are or what you do. Can you kind of break down like what... What do you do with your life? Explain that. I think it, it, it's so hard to explain. It. Like, you know, people ask a lot because it is like a goulage of so many different things that are like intertwined with it all. And even myself, I'm really confused some days. I'm like, man, what is, what is going on here? Um, because I guess like I moved back to the U.S. when I was about 23 years old. Um, with the biggest intention and goal is to work with youth. That was kind of like my interpretation of like what's the biggest need in the world. And so I came to the U.S. working with youth. And so that's always been like my main focus of I really want to inspire and awaken young high school kids uh, to like their potential, to passions, to making a difference in the world, uh, to themselves. And so that's like the goal through that, like slowly developed a talent for video because kids love video. And I started teaching myself how to do videos um, and through that opened up doors to tell stories of organizations around the world. Um, because I was doing it locally for free. I was just like finding nonprofits being like, Hey, can I tell your story for free? I can, I have a camera and an iMovie and was doing that just for fun. And then it opened up this whole Pandora's box of traveling the world to do it. I love that. What a cool way to kind of jump into this trajectory of being a filmmaker. It's interesting because a lot of people who are filmmakers, they're like all in on just being a filmmaker and your films are amazing. And like, I watch them and I'm smiling the whole time. You're doing all of these other things on top of it. Like you're speaking at high schools across the country. You're speaking at all kinds of events across the country. Uh, you're, you're constantly traveling with organizations and people making a difference, whether you're making a film for money or for them or, or not. Um, you're kind of doing all these things. And I would imagine that that makes you better at this art form because you have such a diverse life in a lot of ways. Yeah, definitely. It keeps me engaged because it's like I never get too tired of one thing or the other. Um, and they all intertwine. So every time I do a video abroad, it's a step forward towards reaching more high school kids because 
kids love videos and they love traveling. And so, and it's another story to add to a high school speaking um, event. So yeah, they're all steps forward, which is so, I'm so thankful for. Um, each one is intertwined with the next. So, and, and yeah, I love, I love all of them just as much. Um, and it's been a good balance to, to learn it as I go. But yeah, I think the, the humbling part of like calling myself a filmmaker, a videographer has always been like the hard balance. And I've had to like, kind of like get permission on some level. It's really weird in our culture. We need permission to call ourselves certain things. And so, yeah, the first time someone gave me like a hundred dollar bill, I made a video and I felt like I scammed them and I was like scared. Cause I was like, Oh my gosh, they just gave me a hundred dollars. I have no idea what I'm doing. Um, and slowly through that process, I got this permission to be like, yo, I'm a storyteller. I'm a filmmaker, you know, through videos. And so, yeah. That reminds me a lot of, do you know, Jeff Goins? He's a, he's a writer. Jeff, no. Jeff Goins wrote this book where he basically talked about how for the longest time he just felt like a fraud. He was like, man, I, I, I wanted to be a writer, but I would never call myself that. And one day somebody gave him the advice to basically just start saying like, I am a writer, like in speaking that over himself, the more he did it, the more he realized like, okay, like I'm sitting down, I'm writing every day. That's what a writer is by definition. Therefore I'm a writer, you know? And yeah. it always makes me a little bit sad when people, like I see this on Instagram all the time. When people follow me on Instagram, I try to to look at every single profile of somebody who follows me on Instagram. Cause I just want to know these people. And so I see a lot of bios that say aspiring photographer, aspiring filmmaker, aspiring writer. I'm like, you don't have to be like, obviously there's always a range where it's like, we're going to get better. Like we all dream of, of closing this gap between our dreams and the reality, but you get the opportunity to just do stuff. And that's something that you've done so well is you've basically said, I tell stories and you showed up and you've done it. I, I make films. You show up and you do it. Yeah, the, the aspiring part, yeah, it's so unique because, yeah, who gives the permission to be what, right? Like when do we become an actual photographer, f- filmmaker, videographer? And it's like a youth speaker even. I remember when I started speaking that over myself, that was really uncomfortable and awkward because I wasn't getting paid. Um, and I wasn't like speaking at the biggest events. I was just talking to high school kids and I felt uncomfortable calling myself a youth speaker. And then I just started speaking it over myself of like, dude, this is what you do. This is who you are. And the same with video and the same with everything I do. And it's weird because my dream is to give kids permission, students and kids in high school and young people, millennials to give permission to be what they want to be and, and be fearless in it. And so, uh, yeah, just permission to be yourself. And then also whatever your passion is, that that's what you are, you know? Yeah. Yeah. You, you work with a lot of youth. So like you're traveling around, you're speaking at high schools. Uh, I mean, everywhere we go, like I'll like turn around, like we were, we were just in Israel together and I turned around and I was like, oh, there's BC hanging out with like a whole bunch of like Israeli high schoolers. Like, of course, (laughs) just like making them all giggle. You were like learning how to say things in Hebrew. Um, so I feel like you have a really good understanding of the pulse of this like next generation uh that's just a little bit younger than us what are you kind of learning about this about like their hopes and their dreams you know you're talking about you needing permission do you feel like that's something that's that's true for this next generation are people just kind of taking things uh being a little bit more uh intentional about pursuing dreams like what does that look like um yeah it's it's a good question because it's changing so much and um I'm definitely, I am a millennial and I study kind of what we're doing, but then like the young people, I've just noticed there's a lot more attention that needs to be given to them. I mean, we needed attention too, but my biggest message that I always share with anyone that wants to make a difference is to become a mentor. And I think the mentorship is such a profound piece of just of knowledge and of wisdom and kind of of transformation in a kid's life. I mean, we've seen, you know, kids with great parents, great schooling, great education still end up in horrible situations in life. And so there is no perfect algorithm. It's kind of like this trifecta of like you need a, you need different al- elements. And so the biggest thing I've seen in the generation separations is the millennials grew up without technology and we've learned to use it as a tool and a weapon and, for good and kind of like develop amazing things and create magic with it because we knew a life without it. The kids below us, they've never known the difference. They've never known life without it. They've had cell phones in their hands since they were five, six, now even two, three years old. And so it's a, a crutch to them. It cripples them because they don't know the world without this, this connection of technology. And so my dream for kids is to learn what that, to have a taste of what that looks like to be disconnected from a social web 
and then also um, just be mentored really well of of what it means. I mean, that being socially connected to that since at such a young age destroys the concept of relationships, the concept of friendships, of of socializing. I see young kids really nervous to interact with people. Every time I have my camera, I'm like filming high school kids and all the girls are covering their faces because they know what they look like without an angle or a certain lighting. And that's like heartbreaking because they're, they cover their face and they're like, BC, please delete that. Please delete it. And I'm just like, why? You're gorgeous. And they're just like, no, I have to have the camera at a certain angle and the lighting has to be good for me to look good. And that's like the mindset. They actually think that is how they look good. And so it's tough. It's, it's definitely going to be interesting to see them upcoming, but I just want more millennials to engage in mentorship is the big goal. That's huge, man. And that's, you've got a, basically a squad of, I love saying squad. Uh, you've got a squad of inner city youth in, uh, in the Denver area that you basically like whenever you're in town, you're just like hanging out, mentoring them. Is that right? Yeah. So that's kind of like what keeps me most grounded in what I do is, is I realized in life, it's all about depth with people instead of width, you know? Um, we want to be loved deeply than liked widely. And so I decided to really invest in a small group of kids in my city area. Um, yeah, inner city kids coming from hoods, coming from gangs, coming from low income families, single parent homes, and just started really investing in that culture and that community. And that kind of helps overflow into the rest of the work I do. But that's definitely where I find most transformation and joy, um, which is funny because it's not like most people look at my life and they're like, oh my God, you get to travel the world and go to all these places and, and that's what I want to do. And, it, and it's like, well, what you do is you come home, like real change happens at home, you know? Yeah. And so that's what I want people to really know is, is it, you don't have to go across the country to Africa to make a difference or to find yourself. It's all within yourself already. Yeah, that's great. It's as if you know, it's like the world is a, is a big textbook. You can go out, you can learn a lot, but it does you nothing if you're just like l- continuing to learn and not being able to apply that. And you get to bring that home and you get to be like, okay, here's where I can put this knowledge. Here's where I can put this understanding. Here's where I can put this experience. Exactly. Yeah. There's like one of my favorite quotes is you never fully learn something until you have to teach it. And I love that because just like, it's so profound. I'm like, how well do we know something? Um, and how well are we teaching it? It's kind of like a both thing of like, it's, it's the circle of life as well, you know, of like, I don't know, it's, it's been great to learn that as well. But my, uh, my theory is like this Joseph Campbell, you know, was this amazing uh, philosopher back in the day. And he uh, had this theory of the hero's journey. Of we go on this journey, this initiation, the separation from ourselves and our community. And then the return home is like the, the full circle effect of the hero's journey of like, you must come home and, and apply what you've learned and share with the people what you've learned. I love that. I love that too. And that's that's really interesting because it's like, I mean, there is value in the travel side of things. Like obviously you and I, we both travel a lot and we see the value of going to these new places. You You had a job, you had a role at some point where your role was basically giving people those experiences, people got getting to travel. Can you break that down a little bit? So yes, travel is, is, is amazing. I, I highly recommend always, if you can, um, have a vision to go somewhere and pop your cultural bubble. It's a, I mean, you can't, you can't understand your culture if you don't really experience another culture on some level. And so it's something I highly recommend. I, I'm totally aware it's not the most accessible thing to most of the world. Um, when I was 19, I was the biggest American bubble kid in the world. I didn't know anything about country the cultures or myself really I was going to school to play basketball in Texas and I got injured and so my school I got a, I got a scholarship for a study abroad program and uh, I would have never been able to afford this my whole life I, I was in debt for college all this stuff and I went abroad to Thailand and when I was 19 I got a job offer to organize study abroad for college students and you know it was a huge back in 2000 this was back in 2008 you know uh, so quite a while ago when uh, travel was still frowned upon and somewhat in the U.S. of like, hey, yo, it's high school, college, you know, career, marriage. So I was sitting there in the struggle of like, okay, I just got a job offer to travel the world and take college students around the world, or should I go back to college? I'm 19 years old. I need to figure this out. And my parents were just like, you have to do this. Like, we can barely. Afford. Like, they were they weren't really helping for college. But it was like, you can barely afford college. Um, this is an opportunity of a lifetime. And so I was so thankful they were supportive because no one else was really, uh, culturally. And, and so I did that for like three and a half years. My job was to go around and organize study abroad for pro- college students and then take them throughout Asia and Europe. And so you dropped out of school to do that. Yeah. So I dropped out of college 19, 
um, and just started doing that full time was just living in Asia and Europe and Latin America and just was the coolest job in the entire world. Uh, cause we would take a hundred st- college students from 30 or so countries, 20, 30 countries for six months all around the world and teach them about culture and volunteering and giving back. And so it was this diverse group of students and I was learning every single day and just so thankful that I got this out chance. Cause I don't know what I would have done, um, or who I would have been without it. Um, it really opened and shaped me who I was. And when I was 23, I started reflecting and meditating and kind of like praying. And I was like, okay, what is the biggest thing in the world? Because whatever that is, I want to go do that. So I, in my mind, I'm sitting here, I was in Europe and I was like, okay, is it water in Africa? Because I, I can go build wells in Africa. Is it orphans in Asia? And what it came down to was the algorithm of young people of America. I was just like, we have the biggest opportunity and responsibility to make a difference in the world on a, on a level that is, goes beyond just one person. And so... Uh, I felt that calling kind of, and, and so it wasn't the most ideal. Like I was definitely wanted to keep traveling the world and go live like in these villages in Africa. And so I came back home into Denver and moved, I was 23 years old and, you know, still dropped out of college, moved home and was just like, all right, I'm just going to work with high school kids. And that's the goal. And so, cause I was just like, man, who would I would have been if I didn't get to travel and wake up to myself? What would I have been if a, if a cool millennial came into my high school when I was young and said, yo, you want to make a difference and travel the world? I would have been like, heck yeah, where do I sign up? So I just want to be that person that I wish I had growing up. I I want to be that person I wish came and intervened in my life and showed me who I was and then also showed me a world beyond my bubble. And that's been my goal ever since. I'm 27 now and yeah, I speak at high schools. I run leadership programs, take high school kids abroad and I can make videos on the top of that. So it's been cool. I love that. I love that. It's really cool because your story is so interlocked with all these things that you're doing, like all these things that you're sharing, um, whether you're speaking or whether you're hanging out with your kids or whether you're making a film. What's the message that you're trying to almost get across? If there was one thread that's tying everything through all these things. Oh man, that's that's a good question. I think the biggest thing is, is there's a freedom kind of in in serving and loving other people and, and what that looks like to love other people and and love yourself and and I think like the the love the analogy I love is like the greatest distance we'll ever travel in our entire life is 18 inches between our heart and our mind and and that just so opens up like how do we connect those two things every single day in school for 18 years you learn with your brain with your brain with your brain and you build muscle and the workout and you're always working out your muscles but like when do we ever train and learn with our heart and so I love those those concepts of uh, just how to help people feel and learn with their heart and, and then program their brain chemistry around a, a life of kind of giving, a life of passion, a life of outside of a box that we're put in. Uh, so yeah, I guess it's a mix. It's, it's definitely, I mean, I want people to do what they love, be passionate, and I want people to have a mindset of how can I love people today? I think our reality is only created of two things. Our reality is created of our attention and our intention. And so what's our attention to everything going around us? And then what's our attention? How do we, how do we deal with it? And those two things I want people to just, just tune into and be like, okay, is that person, like when I'm walking to work or to Starbucks, is someone crying? Is someone, you know, does someone need someone to talk to Like where is, you know, these vibrations, these love kind of going and, and stuff. So, yeah. I'm like sitting over here taking notes. I'm like, dang, <laughs> dude. Yeah, I think that's kind of it. I mean, it's always changing too. I'm learning every single day. I feel like I haven't even tapped into what I can know. Dude, that's awesome. That I mean, I love that. You're what, 27 years old right now? Yeah. And yeah, I mean, you're you're on a pretty solid trajectory. This is fun. Like I'm excited to like sit back and watch the next 10 years, next 20 years and to see what the next thing is. <laughs> yeah, me too. I never know what's next, which is cool. I mean, definitely, I think I live in like in this like faith of like just baby steps. I always know that when you have a vision, it's not about the whole vision. It's just about the next step. Do you know what the next step is? Can you take the next step? And that's kind of what I've been relying on since I was 19 years old. And it's, uh, it's been working so far. So like, yeah. I'm trying to be an example because I don't know all the answers. I don't have the funds, the money. I've lived out of my car for a year and a half trying to make this dream happen. Like I've ate, I've only, I've only, I've volunteered at homeless shelters, but I was eating with them while volunteering, like pretending I was volunteering, like, yeah, I'm here to help you, but I'm actually starving. Um, so I've like been in the trenches and I, and I want young people to know there's like hope in this passion. Like I'm the, 
I'm like the richest poor man. I'm the poorest rich man or whatever it is. Like, I feel like I'm extremely rich in just like relationships and love and passion. But I mean, not obviously in a bank account, which is different for everyone. I never want to put people in a box either, but. So I think that one of the first things that I really admired about you was your outlook on life, the way that you see the world. And it sounds like your parents were crazy supportive of you having like this unique experience at 19. It sounds like you've had people who have like impacted your life along the way, but like bring me back a few years. Like what, what kind of set the trajectory? Yeah. Like, like, I mean, you're mentoring like high schoolers. Like what was BC like as a kid? Oh man, I was the worst. I was such a knucklehead. I, so young life was the program I kind of like was in, in high school. And I had a mentor named Brandon, actually super weird. A couple Brandons. Yeah, we're, triple Brandon we're cool alert people. right now. <laughs> Um, Brandon Wheeler was his name and just the goofiest, craziest dude would like do the funniest things. And we were always laughing and, and he was kind of always, you know, just kind of, I mean, I, I still wasn't super attentive of like what he was doing and why he was hanging out with us. And I didn't really realize he was like a 24 year old dude that can be hanging out with people his own age, but he was kicking it with high school kids. And so it was those kind of like seeds that planted. And then three years down the road or so, you know, I was like, holy crap, dude, this dude was like just selfless and like hanging out with kids, you know, like he didn't have to hang out with us. He was a cool dude. He was good looking, funny, and he was kicking it with us. And so I, that was like definitely some, some seeds of like, wow, that's, I'm so grateful for that. I probably would have been even bigger problem if it wasn't for him. And then I would say I was 19 years old, you know, my first time in Asia, Thailand, just my world was rocked on just like cultural differences, right? Like squatty potty toilets where like you're not even sitting on the toilet, you're squatting. And I was just like, oh my gosh, this is, I can't even do that. I didn't think I was going to be able to do that. So, and it was all these moments. And then I was 19 and I went to the Philippines and I was living in the slums for three months and I had a host family. It was my host mom, Gemma, and three kids and she gave me her bed, which was half my size, so it was very small still. Um, it was held up by cardboard, and she went and slept. It was two rooms in the slums, and she slept with the, f- the three kids, and sometimes four kids. One kid came from college, and and I was like, hey, why did you – and our dinner was just rice sometimes. We'd, all we had was rice. And I was like, hey, why did you host me? I was just curious, like, what was your thought? You know, it's it's hard to, like, provide and feed, and, and now you're doing it for another person. And she's like – I know my kids will never be able to travel the world. And so I wanted to bring the world into my house. And it was just like, you know, moments, it's moment and story after story, you know, (laughs) where you're just like, gosh, like what is going on with these people's hearts? Like I could not, my brain could not operate like that. If I'd have nothing in America, I'm not going to help someone, you know? And so it's just these moments of gratitude of, wow, there's a lot of selfless people out there that think so incredibly. And I just took these traits and my brain came started slowly changing of like what is possible in this world and why do people operate this way and why am I so fortunate and blessed like I didn't grow up with a lot of wealth as a kid I mean I remember like working since I was 14 15 and helping pay for groceries and I remember like the struggle but that's nothing compared to these other countries you know and these other countries are in that struggle but they still are giving as much as they can and and so yeah it's just story by story that really started to build my character I think that was a little bit more morally compassed so yeah Dude, that's huge. I love that. I think that during those formative years, it's so important to have experiences like that. And man, that story of your host mom, like how that's incredible. Yeah. And then, so I'm traveling and and so these stories are affecting my body, my brain. Like I said, my brain chemistry, my thoughts, my thinking. And I'm like, okay, I'm so spoiled because I get to do this. And I'm like, well, what about the social media platform? And this was like I just got on Facebook and I started sharing some of these positive stories. And this is kind of where that started, where, I mean, it wasn't anything big to me, but I just started sharing them. And then I started, you know, just slowly thinking like, man, what a platform to be able to have people come travel with me or be part of it and hopefully get to like feel what I'm feeling on some level. And that's kind of what I do now. And that's my dream now with what the work I do is like, how do I get people to, how do I reach through a screen and squeeze somebody's heart? Yeah. Um, And I think, I mean, you're fantastic at that. Like off the top of my head in the last few months, last year, you've been hanging out in South Africa, Ferguson, Ethiopia, Uganda, like you're covering the map. Do you have any like favorite recent experiences that you've kind of gotten to bring people along for? 
Oh, yeah. I think each one has a really divine, unique experience. I mean, Israel, which is the Middle East, and just learning what's going on with that, which just a week ago with me and you, um, was so incredible. I'm so thankful I got to really like get a firsthand glimpse and taste of that culture and that experience. Um, and a week before that was South Africa, which was really unique and uh, a different African experience. A couple months before that was Ethiopia, which was about human trafficking um, and, and really rural villages. And so... Yeah, each one has its really divine opportunity to learn something and share it. Uh, and everyone's kind of hungry and thirsty for it, which has been good. I, I've slowly been seeing like, you know, the platform and the, the videos get more attention, which has been cool. Um, and just like the stories. And so, yeah, I think I just want to keep doing it. And uh, each one, I mean, uh, Ferguson was was life changing for me because it was local. Anything local, I find a little bit more uh attachment to because I'm, I'm definitely, and people are closer to it, you know, like people are closer to the countries and I mean the states that we have and the cities we're in. Um, yeah. Tell me a little bit more about, uh, about your Ferguson experience. Yeah. So very similar experience. Everyone else was having was just, we were listening to media, different sides of media, different opinions, um, which was just obviously the worst thing in the world right now is separation with politics, with religion, everything is just separating and dividing us. And that is just slowing the the process of us coming together to create more wonderful things so a friend of mine this activist in denver african-american activist was like hey do you want to come to ferguson with me and and see what's going on and and just pray with them and love these people and kind of just be there for them and i'm like yeah i'd love to just go learn i just want i want to learn that's all i want to do and and there's a quote that he said that really trying to change the perspective is that you can't solve a problem you don't understand and you cannot understand from a distance wow and yeah, so for me that was so profound because I'm like, so I've been working in the hood. I live in the hood of Denver, and, you know, um, and work with kids of color, and uh, and even them at at that point, even them, I would still hear them say like, this cop was picking on us, or we got pulled over for this, and and I had this like white privilege notion that they were causing it that they were just they were making trouble and that's why it happened and, and that was just in my head because that's how I operated of like cops are good and and you guys you know mess around and then I went to Ferguson and that popped that shattered my whole world of like the real truth of what goes on within like um situations and and whatever your opinion is on Ferguson it's com- I'm completely open to you know whatever you believe but it is a situation that we know now with studies with facts that there is a there is a difference in how colored people are treated in the system and I got a glimpse of that and I got a glimpse of the brokenness I was in the front lines when they made the non-indictment announcement it was tear gassed and uh I think the biggest thing is just we're all humans you know regardless of who we are and I, I want people to not have an agenda or a, a perspective of, you know, people being like, BC, why are you there? You're, you're promoting anti-cops or whatever it is. I was like, no, I'm just here with humans that are broken. I'll go anywhere where humans are broken. I'm going to, if the cops are having a memorial, I'll go there. Anywhere humans are broken. Oh, I want to go feel with them because compassion, the definition of compassion is, is to suffer with somebody. Right. And so you can't learn compassion. You can't read it from a book. You can't, you actually have to feel pain. No one wants to feel pain. And so you really have to tune into like a deeper sense um, of your heart and your mind because sometimes we're inhibited by our five senses. We're like, we can see, we can touch, we can feel all these things. And like, that's what we kind of base our life around. But there's a, there's a higher sense, a higher dimension. You, some might say a fourth dimension of, of how we're connected to each other spiritually on a, on a level that we don't have machines to measure yet, you know? I love that. I love the way that you... Are, are talking about compassion and how you have to show up and you have how you have to be with people and you have to suffer with people. And I think that you are fantastic at building bridges. You know, last week you and I were hanging out in Israel in the West Bank and uh, we just had a lot of conversations where we sat down and where we're like, okay, like this is obviously a controversial place. This is a place uh, where the stakes are high for a lot of people and a lot of people uh, feel really strongly in a lot of ways. But at the end of the day, like these are mothers who love their children and these are fathers who want to support their families on both sides of this wall, both sides of this divisive issue. And it was really fun being there firsthand with you, watching you kind of show compassion to like, to, to suffer with people and experience life with people. And uh, yeah, you're, you're a bridge builder and I love that. Yeah, thanks, man. Yeah, 
I know I get teary eyed just thinking about it, man. It's definitely, and I think that's just like the the hope I have for other people is you know like I just hope other people can feel that that there is like a connection, and I just feel so fortunate I can experience those emotions and tap into that. And I'm like, man, I wish people can. That's what I want. I want people to feel yeah. their heart, you know. And this is something I did not have the answer to, so it's a jerk move to ask you, but like, what do you think? What do you think it takes to get there? Like, why did like like why are some people able to kind of look at these controversial things like the black lives matter movement and Israel and Palestine and not look at it and condemn people, but look at this and, and want to know people better and, and not like not pick sides, but choose to build bridges. Yeah, it's tough. I think it's, I mean, it's a very humbling process because during that time you're stripping away this armor of pride um, because you might have a college degree at Harvard or you might have good grades or you might be really, you might be great, you know, and you have to start taking down those walls and those armor that you're anything and that you're the same. You have to really like level out to you're the same person as the homeless person on the street. And so it's a very humbling experience. It's a very hard pill to swallow. Um, and I think the truth is a really hard pill to swallow because the truth is we are all connected. And the truth is that y- like we are hungry and thirsty for to be ourselves. To remove our mask is very scary because we've worked so hard to build this mask, this facade. We've worked so hard to get that college degree, to get that to get that BMW, to get that really nice car. And to take that off is, is really a vulnerable process. And so it's a lot of vulnerability. Um, it's a lot of losing yourself, um, and it's never, ever finished. <laughs> like it's a, it's an ongoing process, you know. Like, um, yeah, people look at me sometimes, and they're like, "Oh my gosh, you're so you know compassionate, or whatever." Like this, I'm like, "You have you have the exact same things I have. There's no difference. I just, I'm just, I don't know. I've just learned how to kind of maybe story tell a little bit better. I'm not sure what it is, but you know, someone will read a post. It was a, it's a picture of me, like anywhere and I just share my heart of what I'm going through and people go oh that's so amazing I go well just take a picture somewhere and share your heart like you don't take a picture of your food after after you see my post and it says it resonates like then you take a picture of your food it's like you can do these things you can have this process it takes journaling it takes um it takes asking questions like the hard questions and and it takes looking at the world from different perspectives I had the privilege to live with monks for a while I've lived with um, Muslims for a while. I've lived with different religions and beliefs, and I and I really had to take my wall down of like what I thought I knew, um, and what I think I know, to being open and curious of like, okay, these people have dedicated their life to their belief or their religion or whatever or their political or whatever it is. Why do they? Why why do they have such faith in it? You know, and and you have to learn how to swallow pills of like you might not be right. You know, whatever it is, it's it's really intense. Okay, walk me through the process. This show is, quote unquote, a show where I I talk with the happiest people on the internet. And you are hands down one of the happiest people on the internet. And you've got a really, really positive, optimistic way of seeing the world. Walk me through this process of basically, I don't know, I feel like there's a gap between the idea of seeing, like, like with all the traveling you do, with the way that you are putting yourself in positions where you have to stretch yourself and grow yourself you see a lot of pain you see a lot of brokenness in the world um and then you're able to communicate such positivity so much hope like what's walk me through your thought process on that does that does that kind of make sense yeah for sure i think it's the quote you know it goes back to malala when she says you realize the importance of light when you see darkness when you experience it. you realize the importance of your voice when you're voiceless you know all those things of like i've seen like the most hopeless darkest situations of the most unjust things right like little girls in thailand being sold for sex to villages in africa that our kids are dying because of water and food and it, it's just it could easily make you a bitter resentful person. Um, but because of that, you realize the importance of light and the importance of coming home, uh, to a country that has much, um, opportunity to, to fix those problems. And so I definitely am not always happy. I still struggle with those voices in my head and, and, you know, moments of like somewhat self doubt and hopeless moments of just like, man, like what is going on? This is so dark, you know, but, I, I think there's hope in the, in the fact that 
there's young people hungry for it. You know, I, I run a high school leadership academy in the summer with about 300 high school kids. And a freshman kid came this last summer and then he went into his sophomore year this year and he started a nonprofit and he raised like thousands of dollars for homeless people. Raised, he did a 5K run where they raised a whole bunch of pairs of shoes for homeless people. And I was like, yo, man, what? why are you different? Like, what is in you, man? Like, teacher, you're a sophomore. I mean, in sophomore year, I was playing video games and trying to talk to girls and not good at either of them. Um, and so he was like, yo, man, it was it was the Leadership Academy. He goes, he goes I, I saw a glimpse of hope of what I want the world to be like. And I was just like blown away. And so I said, well, I think the biggest reason so let me just reiterate is me the fact that i've been able to transform so i see who i was as a kid and as an american as a like a bubbled narrow-minded not so compassionate person and now what i am so i have hope for anyone so anytime i'm dealing with kids that I, like are um that are like just i don't know like bud heads and just like you know being like tools and all this stuff I, I get like I lose my patience sometimes and I reflect and I breathe in and I'm like, you know what, dude, you're just as bad or worse, you know, so you have to have patience for them. And so uh I think that's my biggest thing. If I can transform, then anyone can transform. And so I really just never have, I never lose hope in anyone. Dude, you're you're so great at this. I love this. This is so fun. <laughs> I'm having a great time just talking with you and just listening to everything you're saying. Like I don't even know what to say. But yeah, I, I almost I kinda wanna transition to this to this thing that I kinda mentioned earlier where we'll be walking around and you'll just like get like I'll look behind me and you're just engrossed in a conversation with somebody else or like I saw an Instagram you posted recently where it's like hey this lady like invited me into her home and like now we're cooking food together and like you're just like <laughs> constantly like you're meeting people and you're uh you're you're like but you're not just like meeting people like you're able to go deep with people well it's like a secret that people can kind of take home to be like here's Cause I think that we all kind of want that. Like I know that I for sure, uh, I don't know, like the way that you see the world is everybody is so fascinating and interesting. And I, I want to get better and better at knowing people in that way. Do, do you have a secret that you can pass along? <laughs> um, a secret. I think I try to picture everyone as myself. If I was in their shoes, if I was a kid in Uganda on the street corner and I knew, all I knew was that, like, how cool would it be if, an, you know, some foreign get kid came up and gave me a harmonica or played with me or just tackled me and started giving me attention and tickling me. And, and I, and I kind of live with that mindset of, like, that person that's sitting over there by themselves. I'm like, what would I, what would make my day? <laughs> and so I try to just think that at all times. And, I, and then I sometimes think, like, what questions do, would I love to be asked? Obviously, what I'm passionate about, what inspires me, what my, what my dream job would be. Um, and then I just recently within the last like six months or so started diving into like more vulnerable, deeper questions pretty quick. And so I, I started meeting people and within like the first couple minutes I would ask them like, Hey, when's the last time you cried? And it kind of came up organically, uh, last summer, but it, it opened up a really cool door to conversation. You know, someone was like, Oh, I cried myself to sleep the other night because my job was really tough. And I'm like, Oh dang, like it got deep and people are so willing to be vulnerable and I'm just like, this is a beautiful thing. Like people can take off their mask that fast. And, and I don't know if I can even take my mask off that fast. And so, and so, um, but I think it gives them permission to like do it themselves or be themselves more and, and, and be vulnerable because vulnerability allows other people to be vulnerable. And so I think the two biggest things is, is yeah, thinking how, what would you, if you were in the, if you were that homeless person in the street, you know, a dollar would be cool, but a conversation would be way cooler. If you were that kid on the street in Uganda, or if you were an old person taking your groceries to your car, you know, it's just like, that's how I kind of like view it all. Yeah. Just an opportunity to like really kind of make someone's day. I think, I think the best analogy is that we're superheroes. We're all superheroes and we all have a superpower and it's love. Right. And we all have a superpower of listening and that's, and that's a superhero power. Cause when we look at Spider-Man and Thor and we're like, Oh, I want those powers so bad. And trust me, I do want a Spider-Man's power. Um, but we totally forget we are equipped with that power every single day. Every single day we can ask someone one question. Every single day we can be fearless and go talk to a stranger. And uh, I think it's really cool to think that way. If we can just have our brain operate that way, it's pretty powerful. Man, I love that. Our, like we have the superpowers and their love. Like that's, that's amazing. Yeah. Well, I think the thing people get mixed, misunderstood of love 
is so when when you read scriptures or our old things or religions, it's like, oh, love people, love, 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 love. In my opinion, love is not kindness. Love is not happiness. Love is sacrifice. That's how you measure how much someone loves you, right? What do you sacrifice for someone else to, to show them that you love them? And if you sacrifice your time, your money, your energy, anything of that, you can measure how much somebody loves you by what they sacrifice. And so we have people every day come be nice to us, you know, as kids, you know, people are like, oh, you're so cute, you're so beautiful, but who's sacrificing for us? And, and that's where love is measured. So when, when, if your goal is, you know, I ask people like, what's your goal in life? Oh, I just want to love people. It's like, well, what do you, how do you do that? I just be, I just be nice to everyone I see. It's like, I, I mean, that's cool. Keep doing that, please. I'm not dogging on anybody, but y- if you want to love people, freaking go sacrifice for them, you know, whatever. And that can be anything big or small. I'm saying from like buying the person behind you a coffee, you sacrificed a couple bucks um, and you bought them coffee. Like that's a, that's a cool gesture or sacrificing your time, having a conversation every, you know, our worlds kind of revolve around ourself and it's like, okay, how do I best help myself? Is this conversation going to help me? Is this, um, talking to this person going to help me is that, you know, I need to get my next meeting. I need to get to this. And we operate in this very like robotic way. And we're not robotic beings We're the most divine beings, you know, ever discovered in the universe so far. And so it's like, we can't be put in a box. And so, yeah, I think just to, to operate in that sense of like a conversation, sacrificing your time for a conversation is, is, is love is powerful. Yeah. And especially in this Western American brain process that we all have where we're very quick, we're very fast. Like that's why we have fast food restaurants because we care about speed and we care about convenience. Yeah. Like basically our time is maybe one of the most valuable things that we have mm. as Americans. And and yeah, basically being able to just give that up for other people says a lot. Yeah, Gandhi said it best. He says actions express priorities, right? And so it's like that's it. I know I can show me what your week looks like and, or your month and, and I can all, and just show me what you what you do. And I could tell what you, lo- I could tell what you're passionate about, you know, or Bob Goff said, I can tell how much you love God by how well you love people, you know, and all those things are just like, they're very simple algorithms. I, if you sit at home every night watching Netflix, no, I'm not dogging on you, but like, that's like the, that's what you're sowing into like your time. And so we, it's funny how we, you know, we can spend so long numbing ourselves with, with social media or TV shows, but we, we can't take a friend to coffee for five bucks because we're afraid of the money. It's like, oh, I can't spend five, spend five dollars on, but no, time is extremely more valuable than money. Money comes and goes. Money is the most like, it just transitions through our life, but time just goes and there will be a moment. And I made a post, I mean, I write kind of like little writing things in my Instagram or social media. I made a post and I was like, you know, I can't predict the future. I'm not that smart of a person. The only thing I can predict in in your life is there's going to be a moment in your life where you have an epiphany and you're like, oh shit, I've been doing this all wrong. I've been looking out for myself. I've been focused on titles and and affirmation and, and accolades and I've missed the big picture of, and my, all my time is gone. And, and so are deep relationships, opportunities, all these things. It's all gone because I was focusing on the wrong things. And I can, and I just, I can feel like there's going to be, you're going to be 30, you're going to be 40, 70, 80, and it's going to happen at one point on your deathbed. And, and so I never, my goal is to not have people realize that too late. And I want people to realize it at a young age that they're like, I'm living for other people. Um, I need to appreciate my, to value my time more than anything else in my life because it is the most valuable thing we have is our time. And, uh, I need to do what I love and be happy doing it. You are a brilliant and inspiring human being, BC <laughs> Serna. I love this. Um, I'm going to transition from there into, uh, cool. I've got a few questions that I love to ask people every single week. The first of which is this, how would you describe the kind of person that you most admire in the world? How would I describe the person I most admire in the world? I th- that is for me someone who walks the walk. I hear a lot of people that talk the talk. There's amazing books out there. There's amazing motivational speakers. There's amazing people you meet, but and it's cool and I appreciate it. But someone that walks the walk and puts their money where their mouth is or um, lives it out. That's where it's just that's where I, I want to be like. And I think the greatest example I have is Tom Shadyac. If you know who that is, he's a filmmaker. He made Ace Ventura, Liar Liar, Patch Adams, Nutty Professor, Bruce 
Almighty. He made all these comedies. Then he made this, and then he almost died and made this incredible documentary called I Am about the world, about what's wrong with it. It's the film changed my life. Um, but at the end, it shows him talking about the world and the problems in the world. But then at the end, it shows him living in a trailer, riding his bike to work, um, just living a very simple life. And, and like I said, you know, I don't want to put anybody in a box. It's not for everyone. But the fact that he was doing all this and then he, the way he lived, I was like, okay, that, I, that man I look up to, that's my hero on some level because he's doing it. You know, Some of my favorite authors that are really great at speaking and love, and I don't want to bash anyone, but they have like mansions of houses, which is cool. But it's just like they live above their means sometimes, and they, but they talk about loving and serving where it's like, or if you talk about radical love and serving, like, yeah, I guess you can live in big houses, but like, couldn't that money go towards really amazing things, you know? So, yeah. People who walk the walk, that's a perfect kind of person to admire. <laughs> I love that. Yeah. Um, okay, so my next question is, uh, what are you consuming right now? Is there anything that you're that you're reading that you're loving or like a documentary that you watch that you're psyched about anything like that? Oh, that's a good question. Um, the last documentary I watched was called revolution and it's a newer one from Rob Stewart. Um, a Canadian guy who goes around the world and talks about the climate change, but also just like, it's a beautiful story of climate change, but also just humans and the environment and the evolution of humans. And so, yeah, I, I watched that and I was, I, I love learning about every kind of topic there is in the world. And so that one really gets my mind turning, but yeah, I would say Evo- revolution by Rob Stewart. That's great, man. That's cool. Yeah. Okay. My last question is based off of the ways that you've chosen to step out, to live life differently, to kind of, you know, live this unique and interesting life. What's one thing you'd encourage somebody else to do in their own life? The, Biggest encouragement, no matter how old you are, is to seek a mentor, seek people older than you. Um, and you know, sometimes when we think that, we're like, "Oh, I need to seek successful people." But seek people maybe that aren't successful, and try to take their wisdom and encouragement, and and hear like you know, like someone that, and whatever success means, they could be working at a whatever, you know, and being like, "Yo, what?" Would, and the biggest question is, "What would you do if you were my age again? If you were twenty five years old, sitting in my shoes, what would you do?" And they'll breathe in, and they'll probably just be like, "Dang." And they're probably going to list off a couple of things about appreciate time, you know, love people, all this stuff, travel more. Um, but keep doing that. Keep asking these older people and, and, and have them encourage and pour into you. And, and yeah, seeking mentors and wisdom. You know, we've replaced wisdom with Google. We Google all of our problems. We Google all of our questions. And there's no intimacy. There's no wisdom there. It's a, very, it's a robotic once again, you know. But, but seeking people um, and just saying, hey, what would you do if you were in my shoes again? Uh, in my opinion, it's like time travel. It's like that person in their mind is traveling back in time to a 25 year old self of them and being like, what would you, yeah. And ask like, what would you tell your 25 year old self? Like me, what would I tell my 19 year old self? The list goes on. Right. And so I think that's the first one is seeking a mentor. And then the second one is becoming a mentor because this person is transforming your life on some level. They're giving you information from the future on, on some cosmic scale. You must, no matter how old you are, somehow learn how to become a mentor in somebody's life. Um, if it's just one person and you talk to him once a month, whatever it is, uh, you know, everything in our world is logical and, and you can't, um, you can't measure or, uh, quantify, uh, love, right? You can't measure or quantify, um, giving, you can't measure or quantify like sacrifice. And so, you're thinking like, man, what is me talking to this young person once a month going to do for this kid? But I promise you, you have no clue. Just like, just the fact that they know you're there and the fact that they have someone to call and just be like, yo, how do I pick up a camera? How do I do this? You know, and is, is freedom to them. Like it's, it's, they're oppressed in a box if they don't think they can, they don't have the opportunity to call someone and be like, like you, Brandon, you're a mentor of mine and you're younger than me. But like I do in my mind always have confidence that like, you know, I can call Brandon and ask him a question anytime I want. And I, and I don't do it too much, but like I have that confidence. Um, and it's such a peace of mind. It's a freedom that I'm never going to be totally stagnant or hopeless. And there's another quote that I love that show me your friends and I'll show you your future. Right. And I always fall back and like, who are your friends, who you surround yourself with? You are a seed and the soil is your friends and the fruit you produce in life is the soil you surround yourself with. And so show me your friends and I can tell you how your life's going to be, you know? Yeah, dude, I I feel the same way about mentors. The only reason that I am where I am today is because I had people that invested in me when I was in junior high, when I was in high school, 
uh, when I was in college, like people have just continued to pour into me and, um, and yeah, it's, I can definitely testify to its importance and its power. And now I'm going to freaking go find someone to mentor. Like (laughs) you've got me inspired in that way. Um, BC, if people, uh, want to find you online, where, where can they find you? How can they follow along with your story? Anywhere on social media, it's just my name, BC space Serna, my last name, S-E-R-N-A. And Instagram, I launched a YouTube channel this year in January to hopefully have a vlog to make the storytelling more transparent, to make it more relational and and uh, not have to make it so curated because I usually make videos for nonprofits that's very curated and, and beautiful, but I want to make more rock cuts. So yeah, anywhere on social media, you can find me, Facebook, message me if you have any questions. Um, yeah, I would love to hear from people. Awesome, dude. Well, I am so glad that we got to hang out and talk today. Like we're buds, but it's every time that we get to hang out is just the best. So thanks for, thanks for being here. Thank you, man. Like, I mean, like I told you before in Israel, man, like when I met you, it was, I could breathe. It was felt like I came up from the water and I took a deep breath of air. Cause I was like, holy crap, there's hope. Cause more people are doing it and you're doing it really well. And I was just like, and, and what, what that means is like there's people that are interested in what we're doing, you know, telling stories of good and uh, being creative and goofy and funny and ourselves along the way and having crazy hair along the way. You might be a little bit crazy than mine, but um, yeah, man, it's, uh, it's, so, it's a breath of fresh air. And I think that's when people get when they come to our profiles and our content is they breathe in and they, they get hope. And like where are people getting hope right now? Because um, our car is driven every single day is driven by hope or fear and the only thing that can kill fear is hope and so when they see what we do and, and who we are same when i met you was just like i was like okay let's keep grinding you know so yeah, thanks a lot man thank you that's i mean that's what this show is all about and that's why you're here today so thanks buddy brothers brothers i'll talk to you later see you man Sounds Good with Brandon Harvey is part of the Gradient Podcast Network and is created in collaboration between me, Brandon Harvey, and Gradient. Find out more at gradient.is. If you want to see a few of my photos and stories from my trip to Israel and Palestine, and if you want to keep in the loop on my adventures, hit the follow button on Instagram, Twitter, and Snapchat. My username is simply Brandon Harvey. That's Brandon with an E-N. And if you go to my website, brandonharvey.com, you can sign up for my weekly good newsletter where I highlight five of the most hopeful things that happened in the world this past week. Oh, and make sure you hit the subscribe button wherever you listen to podcasts. And while you're at it, maybe leave a review. It only takes a minute. We're almost at 100 ratings on iTunes, which is pretty, pretty cool. And one more thing. I just want to say thank you to everyone who's been sharing this podcast on Twitter and Instagram and Facebook. I'm reading all of your kind words and I'm blown away. Well, that's it for this week's podcast. I can't wait till next week and we'll be back to learn from another incredible person. Sound good?